All right, going to continue to talk about truth today. So um, you're probably familiar with the name Bruce Springsteen. Last, uh, last fall, he released his 20th studio album um, entitled, uh, entitled uh, titled Letter to You. And um, interesting little, little, little fun fact is while he was recording and the band was recording the album, they invited a filmmaker into the studio with them and watched and observed the, uh, the recording process and did some interviews. And the, the, the album is filled, kind of has some songs that, that, that deal with life and, and, and some of the, and, and aging, which, you know, the Bruce Springsteen knows that he is a, he's an aging rock star. And, uh, and so well, he, well, he talked a little bit about that. He, he talked about the, the, the reality of dealing with aging, and he, he said this um, in, the, in one of the interviews. He said, it dawns on you rather quickly that there's only so much time left. Only so many star-filled nights, snowfalls, brisk fall afternoons, and rainy midsummer days. So how you conduct yourself and do your work, it matters. How you treat your friends, your family, your lover, it matters. Someday we will close our eyes, the gray evening sky will unfold above us, bringing that long and endless sleep. Even a rock god realizes that he must bow to mortality and deal with the reality of mortality in his own life. So here's what we're going to do. We're just going to dive right in. I'm going to give you the ending of where, where we're talking about today. Today we're talking about worldview, what we call our worldview. And when we talk about our worldview, our worldview is basically our philosophy of life. Your worldview is your philosophy of life, that whole set of beliefs and behaviors and values that guides how you make decisions. And Maybe you have, you've probably never sat down and written out your philosophy of life, but the reality is every decision you make, you filter that decision consciously or unconsciously through your philosophy of life, through your worldview. And if you've ever wondered how you and a friend of yours can view the same exact situation or news story and come to different conclusions, it's because you and them have a different worldview which, by which you are interpreting the world and making your own decisions. And here's where we're going to go today. Jesus wants to change your worldview. Too often, we have been guilty of, 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 of oversimplifying our faith and saying that faith in Jesus is all about praying a little prayer, getting your sins forgiven, getting your ticket to heaven punched, and then, well, I mean, that happens after you die. What do we do until then? I don't know. As long as you prayed the prayer and got your fire insurance card so you don't have to go to hell, you're good to go. That's what it's all about. And I would say that is the starting point that brings you into a relationship with Jesus. And then what Jesus wants to do, this is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, is Jesus will disciple you by challenging what you believe and how you make decisions and what you truly value. And Jesus is working in every one of our lives, if we'll let him, to refine our worldview and to help us see the world as he sees the world, to make decisions as he would make decisions if he were living our life. Jesus is discipling us into a new way of thinking. Here's maybe what that looks like. Here's a really concrete example because it happens in our decision-making process. The path for most of us kind of goes like this, and, and this may be the path that you've lived, other people lived around you, right? You were young, you moved out of your parents' house, and you got that first apartment. And after a little while, getting a job, a little bit of success, then you moved into a starter home, and you bought your first home, but it was definitely a starter home, and it was a starter home because it was never intended to be an ender home, but you started there, right? And then I got a promotion, a little bit more money, and you moved into a little nicer neighborhood with a little nicer house. And then, if you're really successful, you are able to build your house, maybe on some land, maybe an estate, whatever it may be, but that is the process. Apartment, starter home, medium home, forever home, right? And it is a sign of success. It is a sign, and it's also a good financial investment, and that's how we do it. Did you hear, catch what I said, though? It's a sign of success. And I hope when I said that, you thought, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, uh. Because no, it is not wrong to follow that same process. If I'm honest, my life in home purchasing and is basically follow that same process, right? But if you have done that as your sign of success and you hold on to that as a sign of success, I would argue that you have basically followed a worldview that doesn't really match up with Jesus. Now, is it wrong to buy a bigger 
better, nicer house? No, but your motivation for it and your values and what that signifies and how it makes you feel might be indicative of a worldview that is not really a Jesus kind of worldview. It's how we make decisions. How about this one, okay? We're, see, we're just going to dive right in and get in some trouble today. You're looking for a soulmate. We're all looking for a soulmate. And so, young people, we look for that right person. Because surely there's one soulmate out there who's just right for me. And so I find a person, I wonder maybe they're going to be my soulmate. And so we move in together because we want to practice and see and test to make sure that we are emotionally, financially, and sexually compatible. And so we live together and we find out that, well, we're not really compatible in one or multiple of these areas. And so we break it off and find someone else and test it with them, break it off, test it with somebody else, hoping finally to find our soulmate with whom we are completely compatible. Jesus says, I've got a better way. And it's called making a vow to whoever it is that you choose to make that vow to. And then you live out that vow with complete faithfulness to each other. And you keep your vows and love grows over time. And even if there are some ways that you think that you aren't compatible, love and faithfulness and commitment and self-sacrifice, love will grow over time. Why do we make decisions differently? It comes down to our world views. Jesus wants to provide you and I with a new value system, a new way of thinking, new ways of making decisions. Jesus wants to shape your worldview the way you see the world. So if we were to kind of think through different worldview options um, and really try to make it as simple as possible but not, not oversimplify it, we have kind of a couple of options. I, don't, I want to contrast those um, today. And, and if this feels a lot like school, I am just kind of apologize for that. I don't really know any other way to do this. But um, this, this may feel a little bit like school with a lot of information coming your way today. But, um, okay, okay, okay. So, so we can have a Christian worldview, and that is kind of a worldview in which Jesus uh, guides how we make decisions and what we value. The most popular option, um, uh, the, the most popular alternative to that, the, the basic worldview that we see around us in our culture today, in American culture in 2021, um, the worldview that is lived out in most television shows, lived out in most um, social media influencers' lives, would be what we call a secular humanist worldview. I know, really big words, but, but you'll understand as I kind of, kind of contrast the two of them. And basically, your worldview helps you to answer the most important questions questions about life, um, those, those, those basic questions. And so let me just kind of contrast a few of them so you can see how these two worldviews are pretty radically different, okay? Um, so the first question would be a little bit philosophical, but, but you're going to see where this goes and how it gets really practical in a minute. The first question would be, what is, what is real? What is reality? And I know I've got it up there. It's kind of small. I apologize for that. As followers of Jesus, the Christian worldview would say that there is the natural, physical world, that which was created, you can see it and touch it and feel it, that is real, and there is an unseen, invisible, spiritual reality. And God lives in this unseen spiritual reality, God and his angels, and yes, on the other side, the devil and demons and all that, the spirit, those, those kind of spiritual beings, they live in the spiritual, unseen world, and they are just as real as the physical world. The secular humanist worldview says... The only thing that we're sure that is real is the natural, physical world. And if I can't touch it or feel it, I mean, if I can't touch it or perceive it with one of my five senses, then it's not real. You can have a belief about God, and that may help you, and that's great, but it's not really real. What is real is what can be seen, touched, and felt, the natural world, okay? Can you see if this is what you believe and that you, you, you fall in one of these two different places? You're going to perceive the world and people and reality very, very differently, differently just, with this, just with this one question. What is real? Okay, let's take the next step. Um, where did I come from? The Christian worldview would say that you and I were created. This God who lives in the spiritual world that you were created. And we are creatures of a God who created us. The secular humanist answer, who doesn't take into account a God who, who lives in this invisible world, would say, we don't really know. And the best we can come up with is that we were just kind of um, like accidents, good accidents, happy accidents, but still just kind of 
accidents, and so we don't really know where we came from. The best we can say is we are accidents. Okay, next question. Who determines right and wrong? We have this sense of like right and wrong, so how do we know what is really right and what is really wrong and who gets to determine what is right and wrong? Well, the Christian worldview says if there is a God who created us, we'd say that that God also cares about morality. He cares how we treat each other, and he cares about right and wrong, and God determines what is right, God determines what is wrong. Um, The secular humanist says there is no God anyways. We're all just accidents, and so who determines right and wrong? You do. I No, I do. And we're just going to have to trust each other with that. But I determine what's right and wrong for me. You determine what's right and wrong for you because there is no higher being telling us what is right and wrong. Okay, well, then the next question, what is wrong with the world? Because we can look around and see that that there's definitely something wrong. What happened? Like, what's wrong with the world? The Christian worldview would say that this God who created us, who has right and wrong, What is wrong is we have disobeyed the God who gave us these rules to live by. And so we call that sin. What is wrong with the world is sin. And what is wrong with the world is that we have chosen to worship other gods, to put other things in place of the one true God. We call that idolatry. And so idolatry and sin can explain everything that is wrong with the world. If there is no God, and we're not created and right and wrong is up to me and up to you, then how do we explain what's wrong with the world? Well, a couple of different options here. They kind of go in a little bit different directions, but um, we can explain it in terms of lack of knowledge, like ignorance. I just don't know what is best, and if I knew what was best to do, then I would do it. Lack of knowledge or, um, or abuse of power. We're going to talk about this one kind of, kind of a little bit here. That what is wrong is that some people have gotten powerful and too much power and they have oppressed others and that's the essential problem in the world. The next question, and these are all the questions that we ask. And like I said, maybe you've never written this out before, but we ask these kinds of questions and how you answer the question indicates your worldview. Um, the question is, what is my future? What is my destiny? Well, if there's a God who created the world and us, and this God cares about right and wrong, then God has plans. God has a future. God has purposes for us. God has a calling for us to discern and to discover that is our future, that is our destiny. On the other side, the secular humanist option, that if there is no God who has not created us, then what is, um, what is our future? What is our destiny? Well, It's self-created. You have the right to figure out your future and your destiny. Now that sounds really good until we realize that it's all up to me and I better get it right. And in a world now where we have so many options and so much freedom and so many things we can choose from and I have to pick the one and I better get it right, is it any wonder there is so much anxiety about missing out on the best option because it's all up to me? Next question, what happens when I die? The Christian worldview says God, who is eternal, has a plan for that and he'll take care of you. The secular humanist option says, nothing, game over. It's just, it's just it. You better get it right then. This is all there is. Make the most of it. See, can you see already how wherever your worldview lines up on these two options, you're going to make some radically different decisions because of what you believe about the world and the universe. And some of you are like, man, I've never really thought from like a 30,000 foot view of like philosophy of life. But yeah, this really makes a difference on everyday daily decisions. Here's the biggest, most important question of any worldview. And that is, who is the greatest being in the world? Who is the greatest, most important being in the universe? Christian answer says, God. God is at the center of the universe and everything revolves around God whether we want it to or not. The secular humanist answer says, who is the greatest being in the world? I am. And all I'm sure of is me and my one existence and therefore everything revolves around me. 
So let's take practical decisions that we, that we raised earlier, right? The process of grow up, apartment, starter home, medium-sized home, forever home. That kind of a process, right? The secular humanist mindset, the secular humanist worldview would say, this life is all there is. Enjoy it as much as possible if you want to. Okay. Success, finances, all that stuff. The Christian worldview would say, before I decide to move out of the apartment to get my starter home, maybe I should take it to God because I've actually formed a, a community and have a lot of neighbors that I'm having a lot of influence over. And so maybe success is not determined by having my own house and even if it's maybe a better financial decision to buy my own house, maybe God wants me to stick around and continue to rent, which is like the American sin, being a renter for one second longer than you have to. But maybe God wants me to stay here because there are people here that are far more important than my own financial security because I'm supposed to invest in them and that's a part of my calling. And if that's how God leads you, then that is the best thing you can and should be doing, right? That is making a decision with a Christian worldview versus a completely I'm at the center of my own world worldview. How about the other decision about marriage, partners, sexuality, all that? The secular humanist would say, this one life is all there is. You better get it right. You look out for you and have as much fun and as much pleasure and as much enjoyment as you can and only you can decide what is right for you. And in the end, there's no real intimacy because intimacy is, you can't have intimacy when you're that self-centered. And the Christian worldview says marriage is actually not about me. Marriage is actually one of God's greatest tools to teach me that I'm not the center of my universe. Marriage is a really great opportunity to teach me how to serve and to love and to think about myself second. It's one of the ways to get out of the center of my life because every temptation says that I should be in the center of my life. The Christian worldview says that God has told us that sexuality works best and really only works at all in the confines of a committed marriage between a man and a woman. But God says that this life is actually not all there is. And so even if I sacrifice enjoyment in this life, he will bless us in the next life. And if this life is hard, and for those who suffer in this life and maybe even suffer in a really difficult, challenging marriage, that there's somehow an extra blessing in eternity related to that. And I can't even understand that, but God says that this life is not all there is, and so it's not all about just gaining more and more pleasure. It's actually about serving and giving and sacrificing in this life. And all of a sudden you see that we make radically, radically different decisions based on our world view. Your world view is how you think, it's how you make decisions, it's how you see the world, and it is how you view truth. John chapter 14. You're wondering when we're going to get to the scripture. Sometimes the discussion lands on the scripture. Sometimes we start with the scripture. But here's John chapter 14 today. Jesus is sitting with his disciples. We talked last week about how he is enjoying the Last Supper. He has experienced, he's, he's, he's experienced like communion with him. Um, he's washed their feet. We talked about that last week. And now, at some point pretty soon, they're going to leave the, uh, the room where they're gathered. They're going to take one last walk together as a band of disciples, and there Jesus will be arrested, tried, crucified, and died. And they are going to have their minds blown because they never saw any of this coming, even though Jesus tried to warn them about it. He tries to warn them about it even here. For, uh, chapter 14, verse 1, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You're going to see some things that are going to trouble you and mess with your mind, and I've been trying to tell you all along that I'm going to die, but you haven't been ready for it. Do not let your hearts be troubled when you see it. Everything is going to change, but, but don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, so believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and I will take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. He is, of course, describing heaven. He says, I'm going to go to my Father and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I will come back. But the timeline is going to be way longer than you ever expected it to be. But I want you to trust me. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Verse 4, you know the way to the place where I am going. I think he kind of set them up for the conversation here. Look what Philip, uh, Thomas says. Thomas, verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, 
We don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? We're not even really sure like what, what you are talking about here. We think you came from Nazareth, Galilee. Like you're going back to your father, Joseph. Didn't he pass away a couple years ago? What, what are you talking about? We don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? And look what Jesus says to him. John 14, 6. This is one of those verses, I hope, in your Bible. You have it underlined, highlighted, dog ear the page, put a big star in the margin with an arrow pointing to it. This is a great word of truth. It's so important. I want you to read it with me, not just once, twice, out loud. Here we go. Come on now. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Come on now. You've pr- now that was warm up, okay? Now it's the real deal. This is a word of truth that Jesus said. Read it like you actually believe it this time. Come on. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus, we don't know even where you're going. How do we know the way? And he says, the way is not on a map because where I'm going is not on a map. The truth is not words on a page. And the life is definitely not defined by how your friends are living their life with their secular humanist mindset and everything you're seeing on TV and your favorite social media influencers. Jesus says, you know the way because you know me. I am the way. The way to live your life from now until then and the way to get where I'm going to bring you. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And here we see it again, that truth is not just cold and hard, because we do not believe simply in a cold, hard truth. Yes, sometimes the truth hurts, and the truth hurts, it hurts to hear the truth, and sometimes Jesus has to to share with us some really difficult truth, and it's difficult because we just don't want to hear it, and we resist it. But the truth is not, even when it's difficult, it is not cold and hard because Jesus brings an embrace with the truth even when the truth is hard to hear. The truth is beautiful because the truth is not just words on a page. The truth is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The truth is God himself who gave his life for you because you didn't believe the truth and you had other idols and sins and temptations and things you gave into. And Jesus says, I'm going to give my life for you, I the son of God, because I believe so much in the truth and I want you to have the truth and I want you to buy into the truth. But the truth is not words on a page that you check it off and sign your name to it. The truth is me. I am the truth. The truth is a person. Jesus offers a way of life, a way of thinking, a way of making decisions, a way of seeing the world. But listen, listen, his way of life, it will consume you. The way of Jesus is not just to pray a little prayer, get your ticket to heaven punched, and then go on living your merry life. Because if you do that, you will continue to make decisions based on the worldview of all the people around you, and you will make decisions based on a secular humanist mindset. I've seen it happen to good kids who were raised in church and they thought they were good because they prayed a prayer and they didn't really even have a world view of Jesus because they didn't make time for Jesus. Jesus will consume you. He will take all of your energy because he will constantly work in your life and your mind to reshape and form you to think like he thinks. And unfortunately, culture around us has rejected a Christian worldview. And the marketing messages and the lifestyles on shows, reality TV, and social media influencers, those those are dominated by a secular humanist worldview. And you and I need constant reshaping to be continual, refine our thinking so that we're thinking and valuing and making decisions the way Jesus would want us to. So we have habits. One of the reasons you are here today is because you're wise enough to remember and realize that if you're not really careful and if you don't put really good spiritual habits in your life, you will slowly drift. You will slowly start to buy into the powerful messages of a secular humanist mindset and you need regular reminders. So you come to church and we sing songs that not just engage our brains but our hearts and our whole bodies and all of our emotions that again reorient us back to a Christian worldview. We pray because we say, Jesus, I am not the center of the universe. I need you, I need you and I can't do this without you and we pray and we pray and we pray and it recenters Jesus at the center of life and us on the sidelines, just how much we need him. 
We dig into God's word and we get regular teachings of the truth of God bringing us back, refining us, correcting any ways that we've gotten off to remain and live with the Christian worldview. And then we say, go home this week and read your Bible. Why? Not because you're earning points with God, because every time you open up his word, you give God the opportunity to teach you and to train you and to correct any misunderstandings, any ways that your mind has drifted and started to buy into the value system and, and beliefs and philosophy of a secular humanist mind mindset, Jesus says, I'm going to shape you and train you and teach you how to think. And this is going to take a lot of time and energy, but it's the way of Jesus. Because following Jesus is not just praying a little prayer, getting your ticket to heaven punched. The reality is there is a battle going on for the control of your mind and how you think, how you make decisions, and how you view the world. The question is, which worldview will you choose to live by? You will live by a worldview. The question is, will you live by the worldview of Jesus? We have a little bit of, more, little bit of time. I'm, I'm gonna, can we go a little bit more advanced? Can I push you just a little bit more? Okay, too bad. We're going to anyways. Um, a couple of thoughts here. I talked earlier about this secular humanist mindset, right? And as I've thought and prayed and kind of thought through this, I, I realized that the secular humanist mindset actually kind of goes in two different directions. That I think for me has really helped me to understand even some of the debates that we are seeing culturally and politically, okay? Now, now listen, I'm not, not, this is not going to be a partisan thing, but just, just hang on, okay? I believe that the secular humanist mindset we, we asked a couple of questions. We, we said, um, who is the greatest being in the world? I am. I'm at the center of my universe, and I make decisions for me regarding right and wrong. Okay? That's the, that's the core of it. I think secular humanist worldview and philosophy has recognized that we as individuals are not the best in decision makers. And that actually when we get together and we have good fellowship and accountability, that we together can actually make better decisions than I can make on my own. And so, I think what we've seen in secular humanism is an adoption, some places, of a collectivist mentality. And there's a little bit of wisdom in that, okay? You can, you can kind of see that, because generally speaking, we can make better decisions than I can make all the time. But what I see is, is, is rather than in a secular humanist mindset, rather than I being at the center of the universe, now it's we, our community, our culture, our group, our tribe is at the center of the universe. And our tribe, our community, however you define community, we then becomes the greatest being in the universe. And we gives us a sense of meaning, purpose, and right and wrong. Sometimes that is called communism. Sometimes that is called socialism. Sometimes that's given any other kind of a name. But where in secular humanist mindset without God, I see a shift and there are two options in that it can be the individualist option where I'm at the center of everything or we are at the center of anything. I'm my own God or we, collective, is the God, is the greatest good. What I see a lot of the fighting culturally and politically are these two mindsets and these two options fighting against each other. So where do we as Christians line up? In neither one. Because they're both absent of a God who created, who calls the shots, and who controls everything. And we can see the benefit and some of the, some of the value in each of those options, but we stand outside and we say, no, 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 no. None of that works if God is not the center of everything because that is what a Christian mindset is all about. And we don't play on either one of those teams because we play on Team Jesus. And that feels a little bit like we're weirdos sometimes. It feels like we stand out and we're oddballs because we are. A Christian worldview will stand in contrast. We'll feel like we stick out. and We'll feel a little bit weird compared to the other options around us especially the options that don't make a place for God at the center of the universe. The other advanced part I really want you to think about today 
is that I hear some people sometimes saying things like, you know, what we need to get do is we need to get back to having a Judeo-Christian worldview, a Judeo-Christian mindset. What that means, what we mean by that, is that there's this belief that there's an, an ethic, a way of seeing life, a way of valuing right and wrong that is both Jewish and Christian. Judeo means Jewish and Christian. And there's, you know, obviously some, some, some connection as we see in Scripture. And that worldview basically goes like this. There's one God who created everything, and he gave us basic laws, the Ten Commandments, usually is where we land on this, okay? The Ten Commandments. Don't kill, don't steal, don't lie. And if you do any of those things, either God will get you if we don't get you first. And that's the Judeo-Christian ethic and mindset. One God, Ten Commandments, don't kill, don't steal. That's what it means to be a good person. That's what we need society-wide. We need a Judeo-Christian ethic. That's kind of what Jesus' followers thought, too. John said, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life, verse 7. If you really follow me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him. You have seen him. And Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Just show us the Almighty. We believe in him, but we've never seen him. Just show him. That's We believe in one God who gave us these laws. Just show him to us. And Jesus says, that's not what it's all about. And a lot of times when we say, we just need a common Judeo-Christian ethic worldview, and that's going to make everything all right. Just show us God. We'll fear God. And then some of us will pray and get a little Jesus on the top to be able to go to heaven. Jesus says, No. Because in that, you're missing out on the truth of the truth of the truth. Verse 9, Jesus even answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Jesus says, I and the Father am, we are one. And when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Here's what Jesus says. If your worldview does not include me as God in the center, then it's not Christian and it's actually not godly. And it's not the truth. If you want the truth, you gotta get Jesus. He says, I am the way and I am the truth. You don't get the truth from a book. You get the truth from me. You don't get the truth from the Ten Commandments. You get part of the truth. But you get the truth from me, Jesus says. Which is why the whole time, if you could be convinced of one thing in these long months of talking about the truth, it is that the truth is a person and his name is Jesus. And until you have Jesus, you're missing out on the truth. And so if you're concerned about our world, I'm glad. If you are concerned about socialism, nationalism, or any other ism, I'm glad you should be concerned. But the solution is to become obsessed with Jesus. Not with a basic worldview that's just fear God and obey the Ten Commandments. The solution is to become obsessed with Jesus. The solution is for you and I who call ourselves Jesus followers to live the Jesus way of life, which is a beautiful truth. And when people see us living the Jesus way of life in everything we do, even when it costs us something, there is something weird about that, but there's also something weirdly attractive about that. The solution is to become obsessed with Jesus, who is the truth. So let's land on this. Worship team's going to come on back, then we're going to sing, and we're going to turn it into a declaration, okay? Come on, John chapter 14, verse 6. Read it with me one more time. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Stand with me. Come on, let's make this our declaration today, okay? If you believe this, I want you to turn this into an I statement and say, Jesus, I believe that you are the way, you are the life, I believe you are the truth, and that no one comes to the Father except through you. Come on, say it with me. Turn it into a declaration. I believe you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through you. Come on, Jesus, I believe you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life. No one comes to the Father except through you. That is the core of a Christian worldview. And if you start there, you start with the truth, and that leads you into all of the truth. Come on, let's sing, let's celebrate, let's make this our declaration today. Band, lead us.